Okay, kiddos, I think we are live. All right. Dan, Adam, are you with me? I am. And happy Adam. Wednesday, guys. Yeah, happy Wednesday. Hey, we we, uh, we have a, a constant time now, Wednesday noon. Yes. I know, Wednesday noon. Look at us with our consistency. Or really, <laughs> Wednesday well, 6 p.m. Now, <laughs> but... together. <laughs> Wait, what time is it in, are you in Poland or Ukraine yep, right I'm now? I'm in Poland at 6 p.m. right now. Yep. Oh, it's happy Sorry. hour in Poland. What's that? Yeah. It's happy hour in Poland. Yeah, exactly. Let's wrap this up. <laughs> well, listen, guys, we had a crazy city council meeting last night, and I kind of wanted to unpack it with you guys because there were a lot of things that were covered, and um, it was a really long meeting. So I feel like there's a lot of information to get out there to Saratogians. Um, and so I just wanted to dive in, if that's all right with you two. Absolutely. Let's do it. So we started off yesterday on like the happiest note ever, which was the groundbreaking of Fire Station 3 on Henning Road, um, which literally has been a project that was first proposed 29 years ago. So people have been advocating for this third fire station, specifically initially to serve the Eastern Plateau residents um, who we weren't able to reach uh, in enough time to offer emergency, like life-saving emergency services with our ambulance and um, and uh, paramedics, um, but now really it's gonna help coverage for the entire city and response time for the entire city. But it's truly a project that was almost 30 years in the making. And so to be at the groundbreaking yesterday and you know, it, it was just, it was magic. It was great. Let me ask you, I know I, when, when I was, you know, when I was running for commissioner of finance, there was, I don't know if controversy is the right word, but there's three man fire crews and there's four man fire crews. And the idea is, is, is a four-man fire crew is, is much more safe. It's a one-man in, one-man out methodology behind it. Um, but it's like very expensive to have four-man crews. So three-man crews, the argument for a three-man crew, there's a chase vehicle that gets there. So there'll be you know, four men or four women or four firefighters there within, a, you know, within a, a relatively short amount of time. Has that been decided or will that be in this budget, Robin? That is a really excellent question. And I'm impressed that you remember those details because – going from a three man to a four man, it's truly like millions of dollars um, in terms of like the budget difference um, because of how much extra staffing it, were, it would require. So where sure. I left off, Chief Dolan had worked out three man engines and they were running three man engines um, from about August of 2021 through when I left um, at the end of December. Um, I don't know if they have worked out the uh, staffing issue um, thus far. I believe Commissioner Songvi was committed to a four-man engine. So uh, that yeah. was last I had heard. I'm, yeah, I saw on the on the campaign trail, she said four-man engine. So I guess we'll Correct. have to we'll have to wait for the budgets to come out and and see yeah. what uh, what safety has in there for that. Which which will be pretty soon. The the comprehensive budget should be out the first week in October. So we should know pretty soon. Although we could also certainly contact the uh, firefighters union and and ask them if there's been any progress there. Um, but that's a great question. Stay tuned. And um, as yeah. you know, I, I live on the Eastern Plateau. So I'm, of course, from a selfish standpoint, thrilled with this. Ironically enough, uh, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, my neighbors on my, you know, I don't have that many neighbors. I'm on a cul-de-sac, had a fire. And um, uh, the fire, de fire department had to respond. There was almost a time in my life where I thought, that the fire departments weren't so necessary as they were 50 years ago. And that's just untrue. We've had a number of fires in and around the city uh, recently, besides the, the, the first aid issue, which is always relevant. The fact is I was erroneous in thinking that, that the fire uh, threat uh, in homes, maybe it's technically less, statistically less, yeah, but it's it still is. very real. That is a great point. And I think it's probably an anomaly that there was so many that you're talking about in like this time period, because Historically, I mean, the amount of fires we respond to is like a very small percentage of the calls. And that's mostly because we have great code enforcement. We have great um, uh, building codes and, and we're really diligent about inspecting, you know, structures and places to make sure they're safe and um, prepared in the event of a fire. And so, you know, fires don't happen nearly as often. Um, but all of our firefighters are also paramedics who um, run the ambulances. So by and large, they're on the ambulances uh, most of the time or doing fire prevention. Yeah, and, and, and that's where I've used the fire department uh, to my house a number of times. I have elderly in-laws and things like that. And they're so terrific. They're so skilled. I'm so confident when they come through the door. 
Um, and and we're, we're, we're blessed with that. But I, I feel like fire is almost like shark attacks. Yeah, statistically, shark attacks are low. But when I'm at Cape Cod, guess what I'm thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say there's such great you know, people in general in the fire department. But when I see them in action and I've seen them you know, on scene responding to like a bad medical emergency, it is breathtaking to me, like how they work, the professionalism, the the skill, the expertise. I mean, it really does give me like a lot of confidence having four little kids here and just feeling secure about, you know, having having life saving emergency medical services and and really incredible trained professionals. Um, Robin, the does, does our fire department, are there females in our fire department? Yes, yes, we actually have uh, a lieutenant uh, who's a female and we have a new firefighter who's also female. All right. Good. Yeah, and um, the Lieutenant uh, Liz Greeby was just recently promoted, and I was so proud of her um, because sure. it's certainly not easy being the only woman in any organization, um, especially in a male-dominated field like um, fire departments. So, and, and a little off topic, but I know I know the fire you know they they, they sleep at the station sometimes. Mm -hmm. Is it is there mixed mixed quarters there? Does do the females have a a, a separate set? <laughs> Separate. And, and that and that's been part of the struggle, though, you know, is that obviously, you know, you need separate like locker rooms you need when you're coming in from having responded to a fire, the way you have to decontaminate yourself and, and take all your equipment and gear off. I mean, you, you really have to have privacy, you know, for men yeah. and women. So um, I'm glad we're able to accommodate that. And I am really proud to have, you know, women in our fire department. I think it's awesome. Yes, you, you may recall several years ago, 12, 14 years ago, when the females in the police department uh, took a case to the Division of Human Rights because the locker oh, room yeah. facilities were inadequate compared to the men. And they I won think that was, money. I think that was when Ron Kim was public safety commissioner, if I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Know, I'm not even thinking about it. I don't know. That's it's sort of ironic because what we're talking about. We have All so right. many. Um, I was, we do I was, have a lot of amazing police officers who are women too. They are like we have an incredible group in the police department as well. So yeah. go girls! Yeah. All right. So we had a city council meeting yesterday. We had a city council meeting yesterday. Sorry. Yes, I got sidetracked on Fire Station Three. So um, one of the first things that came up um, was in public comment. A ton of neighbors from Grand Avenue and the surrounding kind of neighborhoods off of Grand Avenue came to public comment to talk about pedestrian safety bike safety and basically how, uh, you know, the speeding and the way people are driving on Grand Avenue makes it impossible for them to go anywhere on foot or on a bike with their kids or by themselves because it's just so dangerous. And it really, you know, brought to light again, this issue of connectivity in the city. Um, and so they're petitioning for sidewalks and shoulders and bike lanes and so forth. And I just wanted to kind of like throw it to you guys to see what your thoughts are on just the city in general and how we do with, you know, connectivity, access for people on bikes, for people walking, because I feel like we've had a lot of kind of hit and misses and we're a little disjointed with where we are right now. Hey, uh, Adam, do you want, uh, go ahead, Adam. Uh, well, you know, I, I was going to say, I think there's, you know, the, the when you have councils coming in every two years, you have initiatives that, 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 are born but never really seen through to, through fruition. I just in, in in some of these European cities I'm visiting, you you can start in the city, you can go for a walk, you can walk to the lakes, you can walk through the forests, uh, and and not only can you walk on, on a path, but then next to it is a, a path for the for the bikers, um, right. not motorcycles obviously, but uh, and so it's I I think we can do better, but it's difficult because a you know our budget is. is I think what, around 50 million. It's not a big budget. Yeah. That's the whole city, you know. So this is a, a big number to to really connect the, the, these these all these areas. Um, and I don't know what the solution is because again, it's hard to it, it's hard to with the new administrations coming in every two years. It's hard to 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 have this grand master plan. Um, but I I would like to see more bike lanes, uh, safer bike lanes. You, you, this, bike it, it, it was a big turnout yesterday with this grand. So this is not one neighbor overreacting. This certainly seems like it's an issue uh, in Grand Ave. So uh, I, I'd like to do better, but I don't know in our budget how we do it. It is phenomenally expensive. Like I could not believe how expensive it was to do bike lanes, to fix an intersection. I mean, it's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get the engineering and design work. I mean, it's a, it's, 
I think people would be really surprised to hear what the numbers are um, associated with this stuff. But um, I agree, like we have the Lake Avenue bike lanes, I think are incredibly dangerous. I won't let my kids bike on them. Uh, they bike on the sidewalks. Um, so I feel like we've done them in some areas, but we haven't done them quite right. Um, mm. I also think it's unrealistic to think that this is going to be a place where you could bike to work year round. I mean, we have winter here and ice and snow. And so like, that's, you know, um, problematic, but, but in general, I mean, I live right downtown and there are areas where there are no sidewalks where I'm walking in like the inner city core. Um, so we do have a complete streets plan and we have adopted one. Um, but Adam, I think you're right. Like with all the turnover on the council, um, these projects that get done are are not necessarily done in the right order. Um, and there's kind of, there seems like there's been a lack of kind of bigger picture thinking. Um, but last night, Tina Carton, who uh, works on all things sustainable, environment, pedestrian, bikes, everything, gave a presentation and she has put together a map of the bike lanes that exist now, the sidewalks that exist now, what's missing, the high use areas, the high accident areas. And it seems like that will help kind of kickstart a better, kind of more efficient approach towards getting these things done. Yeah, if I could jump in, you know, for those of you yeah. folks that did not see the city hall meeting last night, Robin, thank you, you framed it up nicely for us uh, before the show and we were able to, to get right to the key points. Uh, there must have been about at least seven, I think, residents from Grand Ave. And Robin, you commented, oh, yeah. you just really haven't seen that too often. And they were passionate. They were well-spoken. Yeah. And I was like feeling for these people. And I'm like, and yeah. the gist of it was, is how long is it going to be before a kid gets killed? That's that's what's, what some of it was being. They talked about car accidents, bad car accidents, where a father uh, had to be taken to Albany Med. I think he was airlifted. Uh, the, 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 the resident who was speaking last night had, had the three-year-old child in the backseat. Thankfully, unhurt, but on his on their front porch as they sued the child regarding his dad going into an ambulance or her dad going into an ambulance. Um, the city's on notice now, and they even said, uh, Mayor Kim said, you know, I, I canvassed out there during campaigning, and one of the residents said, yeah, I, I told you about this issue, and, and not in a pointed uh, gotcha sort of way, but she, you know, it's it's a it's an issue. They're clearly on notice now, and yes, it is expensive, and some of it is time consuming, but it only takes thirty minutes to to assign a radar. Uh, patrol out there to to slow the speed limit is there's some medium you know there's immediate things they can do some uh, uh mid-level things they could do such as speed bumps and uh, a radar sign where it tells you you're going 44 miles yeah an hour. every time i see those i'm like holy cow i didn't realize i was going that fast and those are so, and then long term the reconstruction of the streets the sidewalks the bike paths uh so the city needs to do something for these people for all of us wait dan I have, a qu I have a question for you with your law enforcement background, because I was kind of surprised that no one brought up doing, um, s you know, speeding enforcement, because it seems to me like that would be the very first most immediate thing I would do is start, you know, giving people some speeding tickets and pulling people yeah. over, you know? Yeah, and, and get the word out there one way or another, or one of those radar signs that I mentioned, something like that, that can be done relatively quickly. And that's yeah. not the whole answer. Um, you know, I, I'm not one of these ex-cops that's say, uh, you know, arrest everybody and force everybody to write a million tickets. But that is part of the answer. And that is something you can implement, like I said, with, within about 30 minutes, uh, you, you you can have it out yeah. there. And um, so we'll and we go slow down uh, uh, Grand Ave because A, it's the right thing to do. But uh, 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 secondly, there might be a police car there because we're advocating for it right here. That's right. Um, we do have one of those, um, like, this is how fast you're driving. I think we have two signs like that, those radar signs. But I feel like kind of the jig is up with those in a way because we know that there's rarely enforcement behind it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I feel like people just keep blazing by those. So, but a few, a few speeding tickets can have a very sobering effect, especially when we're talking about, I think they were saying a lot of high school kids are on Grand Avenue, um, kind of flying down the road with their new license yeah. and yes. uh, mom no, and dad aren't admit, super happy. I, I'm on Grand Ave rarely, but I admit coming down there, it feels like a road, it feels like more like a country road when you're coming in from Milton. So my speed is yeah. probably been at, a, at a, an appropriate level coming down that road. Yeah. Well, anyway, moving on, you guys, just because there's so much to talk about from last night. Um, one of the other things that was brought up in public comment and then responded to by Commissioner Montanino um, was someone came in to talk about uh, school safety and specifically that they, while well, they appreciate having an SRO, which is a school resource officer in the high school and one at the middle school, 
we have no uh, police officers or school resource officers in any of our elementary schools. And so she was asking that uh, the city consider uh, putting SROs in the elementary schools. And Commissioner Montanino responded, and to my surprise, said that he had been working on getting two more SROs into elementary schools. And it, this seems like a simple issue, but if either of you were here and kind of paying attention to this kind of stuff back in 2018, um, this came up in 2018 and it was enormously controversial. Uh, the city passed a resolution offering to pay for more SROs uh, for the city schools. The school board did not respond. They did not take any action, nothing changed. And so this kind of issue of, it's our police officers who would be the SROs in schools, but it's really the school district, I guess, that needs to make the decision of, okay, yes, we want a school resource officer in this elementary school. Now we'll reach out to the city. Like, it doesn't seem like it works when the city says, we want this to be done. The school district doesn't seem to be responsive. I don't know if that's what you all have observed, um, but that's been my experience. Yeah, my, my, my first impression of all this is that the there's a lot of misunderstanding about a, what an SRO is. I don't think anybody's talking about arming. You know, my mother was a first grade teacher for 40 years. We're not talking about arming her. We're not talking about arming teachers. We're talking about p police officers Act who are trained to handle duty police officers. Yeah. yeah, active duty police officers. So so the idea that that you have a trained professional with you know who's able to meet uh, force with force, I think is is to me it's a no brainer, and, and we've talked about this before. But it's it's it doesn't oh you know there's there, there's 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 instances where school resource officers you know armed guards in the schools. Um, I, I don't want to I don't want to call them names, but they 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 flee from the you, the well, you've all been. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. You've all yeah, these. Yeah. They, they fail from, somehow, some way. Yeah. Going to, going to, but, but you know what? It's, it's, it, it, if it, if it, if it cuts down half of the, these, these incidents, if they're able to, to engage with these suspects or these, these people committing these crimes, um, it, it, it half the time, then, then, then it's a no brainer because it's, it's how you stop somebody with a gun. Dan, would you agree so with Dan, that? Because, yeah. Dan, I, I have questions for, for Dan about this because for me, an SRO is not to stop someone with a gun because that's going to be like the most rare situation that we hope never happens. To me, it's more like I would like an SRO in the elementary school to start establishing a positive relationship with kids when they're young and really being a resource and, you know, identifying kids who might be having issues before they bubble up and become a school shooter later on. Exactly. People, some people may not realize, and if they don't have kids and they're not law enforcement related somehow, they would have no reason to realize that the SRO does so much more than security should a, a person. That's an important part of it, significant. Um, but there's added benefits to that. And Robin, you touched on some of them. Um, back, back when things were evolving, um, uh, the, the troopers who were SROs, uh, Governor Elliott Spitzer at the time on, 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 uh, did that program, which was a shame. But um, they were dealing with new things, whether it would be bullying or drugs or that when sexting first became a big issue, yeah. um, that, that created all sorts of issues because uh, uh, you'd get a 13-year-old person who did it to one person, and of course, it's through the whole school. So they're dealing with so many things, and not purely with an enforcement angle, like you talked about, yeah. it, establishing yeah. relationships, establishing relationships with the parents, proactively solving problems and things like that. So, but yeah, there is that added benefit, and Adam points it out nicely, that God forbid, should the unthinkable happen, is you've got a, a trained armed police officer who is, is hopefully gonna perform uh, appropriately and, and be led appropriately, and I'm, I'm, I'm making a, a not so veiled uh, reference to, to Texas, um, and, and stop a horrible tech. Yeah, I will just say you know, what you're saying. I, I, I remember, you remember DARE, the, the program DARE? Yeah. And I well, remember the DARE officer, Officer Mullen, whose, whose son is now head of the, he's, he's, he's following his father's footsteps, he's head of our PBA. But Officer Mullen was one of my first um, interactions with the police officer. And I have very positive memories from this. You know, of, of, and, and I know that DARE was different than what we're talking about, but but this idea of, of 
you know, the police officers being in schools is threatening to some children or, or it, 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 it certainly it has the ability to be. But I just, I, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. And, and I think that, the, you know, the Saratoga police and, and our police force is good enough to, to make sure that they're having a positive in, influence on these children as opposed to a, 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 you know, a fear, imposing fear on these kids. The entire city council actually took that moment to um, acknowledge Officer Barrett, who's our SRO in the high school, and basically said he's revered by the students and just beloved by the student population, as was Officer Lloyd Davis, who was the SRO before him. And so we've had a lot of success with the officer that we've had in the high school and their relationship with the student body. Um, but it also solved this other issue that no one has mentioned, which is our summer staffing issue is solved perfectly by adding extra SROs because during the school year, they're in school. And then in the summer, when we need more staffing, they're available to be patrolling downtown, which is exactly what Officer Bear does um, as an example. And that's really, to me, like the best solution you could come up with for our staffing issue and the, you know, the extra staffing needs we have in the summer. There's a tangent here I want to talk about. I won't interject it now because I don't want to get us off that. But at the end of this loop here, can, can you turn over to me? I, I want to bring something up slightly related to what you just said, Rob. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, have at it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I've lost track of the issue that was so hot six weeks ago with the new new uh, proposed uh, CBA with, with the, the PBA and the 12-hour shifts and the 10-hour shifts and so forth. Has that... Has that gotten traction anywhere I, it's been silent that i could see yeah it has been completely silent that i have seen too the last i heard i think there were some members of the council who wanted like an independent audit of how this would affect the finances and, and what needed to be adjusted in terms of numbers and i think that was the last i heard but i have not heard an update since then Okay, interesting. We'll have to follow have up on guys? that and make some inquiries. And Robin, you've got the most connections there, so maybe next week we can uh, follow up on that. And maybe maybe someone would like us not to follow up on that, but I think I think we should. No, I, I think we should as well. I'm guessing also because Commissioner Songvi is away in August. Um, she's kind of a critical component to getting that passed as the Commissioner of Finance. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I have I have not heard anything. There's a couple issues like that actually that I haven't heard anything about. That also the Civilian Review Board. I don't know if you guys remember, I'm sure you probably do. The Civilian Review Board was put together by Commissioner Montanino back in February, March, I wanna say. And I haven't heard a word about it since then, except from the head of the Black Lives Matter group in Saratoga Springs, Els Figueroa, who um, put out kind of a press release saying that he really felt that he should be on the Civilian Review Board. And uh, that was actually addressed last night by Commissioner Chris Matheson, who is one of our former public safety commissioners. Um, Chris made a public comment saying that he felt that uh, Mr. Figueroa, who was organizing many protests, uh, as we recall, over the last few years. Um, and called the police department murderers. Uh, correct. And kind of went up and down Broadway and, you know, asserting that the, our police department killed Daryl Mount. Uh, again and again, and it was Commissioner Matheson's feeling that Els was not the right choice to be on a CRB and also owed the city and the police department an apology for the accusations that he was so public about um, that were false. But aside from that, I haven't heard boo about the CRB and what's happening with it. Have you? I, I, I'm not, and I, I think uh, our past Commissioner Matheson made a good point. It's kind of like me as a... a uh, retired police officer, not that you couldn't put a retired police officer, but if I sat here and said, everything the police department does is absolutely right. Um, they're never wrong. It's the, it's the, the defendants that are wrong, period. Well, then I'd be a terrible choice for that too. You, yeah. you need open, open-minded people there, uh, that, that, that are going to look at, at, at things with an objective, uh, viewpoint. And yeah, like you're I picking think, a jury kind of. Yeah. Yes. Right? So, say yeah. That again? Like picking a jury. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's there's some, so some similarities, me, for, uh, some analogies for, to that. Yes, for all these all these protests that were happening, all these you know closing down our streets and blocking Broadway, and our police is our our police officers are murderers, and you know there were a lot of people involved with that. And I, I wonder, I wonder in, in, in reflection, right? Hindsight's twenty twenty. If they sit back and say, not just Els, but but other people involved in all these protests, that, that maybe they went a little too far. Maybe these protests were a little overboard. Um, 
I, I just don't know. I, I can't. You haven't heard much from the from from these groups uh, as of late, uh, and, and why? And 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 kind of looking back, that our you know our police, Commissioner Montanino did the report that you know pretty much stated most likely our, our police did not you know beat up and murder Daryl Mount. Um, so all these people who 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 were supporting this idea and pushing these things on our city, are, are they are they still think this is an issue, or or do they think their actions were were a little out of line? I I don't know. I'm just curious to. To, to, you know wh where where they would be at because for me it just was extreme and 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 not not portraying truth. You know I think there's like a constant debate as to how you go about um, social justice in general, and some people take an approach that is you know more aligned with what we saw in the '60s and like you know passive resistance and um, a, a more almost like a more traditional way of protesting. And other people think that you need to be more radical and in people's faces and use, you know, more aggression and and uh, kind of not intimidation or fear, but just kind of like a heightened level of emotion and aggression um, to get things done. And I, I, and you know, what's most effective? I don't know, but I do think there was a lot of a lot of collateral damage that that came out of the the BLM protests um, in Saratoga Springs. A lot of collateral damage. Um, and not a lot of positives that I have seen. But I'm obviously fairly biased considering I was running public safety at the time, so. You, I, you were the I, target of much of their ear. Yes, I was. <laughs> I, 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 I do see a couple, I don't wanna say positives, but um, um, the fact is we now have a more diverse city council than we ever have. Yes. Um, that's significant, whether that's a result of that is a subject to debate. Um, the civilian review board. There's, I had a lot of like issues with it. It's not a panacea. It's not a lot of things. But the city is moving forward and and attempting to address some of those concerns. And you're not hearing so much or at all anymore that Saratoga is a racist city and Saratoga is this and Saratoga that. Now that could start up again tomorrow. But I have seen uh, some uh, movement to a more uh, level-headed uh, dialogue. Uh, maybe by having maybe, maybe there's other problems elsewhere that have taken people's time. Maybe it's summer. I don't know. But I have seen some positive uh, changes that have been uh, maybe slow and not so noticeable, but 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 they are there. I think those some of, I think a lot of that, in my opinion, can be attributed to just the national social justice movement that started after George Floyd was murdered. Yes. And it allowed for conversations about race to happen in cities like ours that's predominantly white. And you know, conversations about race weren't happening and really needed to happen. And so I, I do agree that there's been some positive benefits, um, you know, for people to have conversations that um, have been awkward or uncomfortable for them or, you know, um, have been silenced for whatever reason. Um, I think that's really, really important to, for us to be talking about these issues, um, especially for younger kids and students. Yes, I, I would like to see you know the the, the city come, become even more diverse with with the with the police department and the fire department and um, uh, you know uh, things that matter like that things that are important. Uh, I would like to see even more diversity and how we get there is uh, maybe a subject for another day. Yeah, it, it well it is because you yeah you basically can't go out and say like okay we want to hire this race. You, you, yeah. that's illegal. You literally can't do that, but you can change the way civil service works and how we're getting the message out. But that's for another day, a conversation right. for another day, I suppose. Um, so also on the agenda last night, uh, Mayor Kim is forming a cannabis task force. Am I saying that right? Cannabis, like marijuana, a marijuana task force um, to talk about how, I guess, Saratoga Springs will be handling uh, dispensaries, sales, um, you know, where, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure the specifics of what this committee is going to do because the city has already opted in to uh, selling, disp having dispensaries, and also having um, lounges. Um, the zoning has pretty much been established, um, but I think the permitting process and uh, I guess some other kind of more granular issues uh, need to be discussed. And so he's forming a cannabis committee. Um, I guess people are interested in being on it, weighing in on it. Uh, they should contact the city council because all the city council members will be appointing someone to the committee. Um, but uh, it'll be interesting. A lot of our surrounding municipalities have opted out of this. So we're going to be, you know, uh, 
one of few in upstate New York um, who will have dispensaries and so forth. Kim's Cannabis Committee. <laughs> Kim's Cannabis. Yeah, I can't say it. It's like a tongue twister. But yes. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I, so I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I've been to Amsterdam, Holland a number of times. Actually, we'll, when, when, when on my return flight uh, out, of, out, of, out of Poland, we have a 24-hour layover in Amsterdam. So uh, we'll spend the, the spend the night there. And I think, you, you know, something that scares me is that, and, and hey, I should say, I'm pro-opting in for this cannabis, you know, to have marijuana in Saratoga, both lounges and, and dispensaries. But the one thing is with, with, the the law in New York State is if it's legal to smoke a cigarette, you can smoke marijuana. And the, the, the problem is, is when you smoke marijuana, that smoke then can affect other people, right? So you can smoke a cigarette on Broadway. I don't want to walk down with my kids through a cloud of marijuana. Um, I just, you know, I think most rational parents, not that I'm, you know, think the, the, the yeah. kids are answer and become addicted, but it's just, it's just not something I, 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 I'm, I would want for my kids. Yeah, that so, ship has basically sailed, by the way. Like uh, Caroline Street is reeks of pot all day, all weekend long, all weekend yeah. long. Yeah. yeah. But, but this, you know, so as far as dispensaries, I, I think all for it, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a dispensary on Broadway, but uh, I think in, in areas around Broadway, I think lounges too. I just don't think uh, cannabis lounges in our core downtown is a good idea. Um, it, it's, it does, it can bring a, although, Boy, the bar, the alcohol brings kind of a certain crowd too. But yeah, um, it's it's it, it it's just not something I think is synonymous with downtown Saratoga. I, I I think it's something that that you should you know that that should be available, but not in our our city's core, not not the dispensaries or or the uh, the lounges. What, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I might have actually agreed with you like two months ago. <laughs> However, and this is gonna this is kind of like an embarrassing stereotype that I'm going off of here. When Dead and Company were supposed to have a concert here, and then like John Mayer had to cancel at the last minute, and all the concert goers came to Caroline Street and said the party, they were all pot smokers. There was no drinking happening. And it was the best vibe I've ever experienced on crowded Caroline Street. They went home early. They were the friendliest people. I was walking up to my office, which is on the top of Caroline Street. I bumped into about a million people holding stuff. I was apologizing profusely, expecting to get like punched in the face. And instead I was getting like, no worries, like peace, love, happy. And I mean, it was just a remarkable difference. To see Can you imagine the sales were... at Jerry's that day? Ben and Jerry's must have had a... Had a... <laughs> <laughs> I know, and they went home early, like the street cleared out early. So the difference, so I guess just the difference of drunk, drunk people versus people who are smoking pot, it's night and day in my opinion, night and day. You may have changed my mind, Robin. Dan? Try, try this one out for size. Gaffney's Cannabis Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> well. My music, though. <laughs> the old, my only concern, though, is dry. We have no way. Dan, can you confirm this? Thing? We have no way yet of being able to test someone for being high from smoking pot while they're driving. And um, that, to me, is concerning. No, I, 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 it always was. I thought you get it through blood, but it's very cumbersome and quite involved. Uh, rather than a DWI, which is pretty uh, efficient, you know, you yeah. have to go to the hospital and draw blood. It, it's and then you take one cop or two cop off the roads for those two hours. It's just very, very cumbersome. It's technically feasible, just difficult. Is back what I remember when I was on the road a long, long time ago. Can 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 a police officer? I mean, theoretically, a police officer, you don't. It's just evidence, right? So so you don't actually have to have a positive result to say a driver's impaired. A police officer can testify to that fact. Am I correct? There, it's it's a common law DWI where you know besides a, a chemical test, um, yes, you can sustain a conviction for alcohol. It'd be harder for for drugs, but uh, maybe conceivable. But there have been convictions that had that there was no blood test, there was no um, uh, hmm. uh, breathalyzer. Uh, they're rare. They're hard to get, but they they have happened and they do happen. It is a separate section of the vehicle and traffic law called common law DWI. You know, you you got ten witnesses saying he he drank fifteen beers, and then those you know, another ten witnesses saying we saw him stagger to his car and drive. That, that'd be a common law DWI, but you need a lot but, of evidence. Well, I'll I'll, I'll make 
promise to our viewers, one while on Holland, I'll do some uh, some field research and <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, wait, but honestly, wouldn't you agree that almost every teenager knows that drunk driving is dangerous, right? Like that's like a commonly held common knowledge. Yeah. But would a teenager know that it's really dangerous to smoke pot and then get in your car? Because it really is. I mean, like I smoke pot, I get effed up. I do not drive if I have smoke pot ever. And I think that message has not gotten through to younger people. And I think that we have really destigmatized marijuana in a way that's like actually a little, we've made it seem too casual for kids um, with vaping and, you know, being able to grow up to, I think, 10 plants in your home and the access that they'll have to pot um, is nerve wracking to me because it's not, you know, it, it's not like a nothing. It's not like having like a little half of a wine cooler. I mean, it really, it affects you. It's a good, it's a good point. Yeah, I know. Ooh. I know. It, I know it affects different people differently. But for me, if I if I smoke pot, boy, I can't walk barely. <laughs> I know. It's driving me the last thing I'd want to do. But but anyway. Um, all right, moving on. So what else all right, moving on. All right, what else happened? Let's see. Oh, all right. Well, the drama of the night was between Mayor Ron Kim and Commissioner Dylan Moran, and this is kind of a continuation of the same thing we were talking about in the last podcast, which is a little complicated, but essentially boils down to the city has to pay a $25,000 deductible to Travelers Insurance, which is our insurance company. And it's because we had a settlement with a gentleman named Tim Wales of $100,000. He had sued the city like four years ago. The insurance company retains a lawyer. They negotiate on behalf of the city. The city has no input into those negotiations. And ultimately, the insurance carrier decided to settle with this gentleman. And so the city is obligated contractually to pay this $25,000. Um, so Commissioner Moran put it on the consent agenda at the last city council meeting, and it, it created a shitstorm. Basically, there were people on the council who thought uh, he was trying to like hide it in the consent agenda and not bring anyone's attention to it. Uh, Mayor Ron Kim is convinced that Dylan Moran unduly uh, was involved in negotiating this settlement and didn't inform the city council. He accused Commissioner Moran of having a massive con conflict of interest with the plaintiff. Uh, he, he he accused him of pretty much everything under the sun. It was it was pretty nasty, and it remained nasty last night. And again, Commissioner Moran was incredibly measured and controlled and calm in his response uh, to uh, Mayor Kim's accusations. But it, it was a nasty, it was a nasty scene all around. I was like holding my breath listening to it because it was just, it was just not a good look for anyone. To me, it wasn't a discussion that should have been had at the city council table. And also Mayor Kim seems to be just convinced that there has been nefarious action, um, you know, on the part of Commissioner Moran. And, and I'm not seeing that, but he won't let it go. And it, it just was, it was not good. I, Dan, I know you saw some of it. Uh, yeah, and, and also uh, I, I, we should point out that there were some barbs sent to Mayor Kim's way as well regarding a letter he wrote uh, regarding oh, yeah. that lawsuit that he wasn't authorized to, to, to do specifically what he did in that letter. He, he overreached immensely. It was it was yeah. like really a turnoff. He did. Like, yeah. Last night I had a dichotomy. You had the people from Grand Ave coming to their city government and almost pleading and saying, please help us. And an hour and a half later, it devolving into a petty, ugly fight. And you're, you're right. I, I think Commissioner Moran is has been measured, but I'm not going to let him completely off the hook. I'd be more pointing to, to Ron Kim, who looks more culpable here. But the fact is that two of them, I was turned off to both of them. And I, and I like both of them, but I was really turned off last night. And the other three council members, they don't get off the hook either. They need to resolve this as a city council. It's not Dylan Moran's problem. It's not Ron Kim's problem. It's the city council's problem. And they need to stop this. That's, that's but can I just tell you what the fundamental problem is? They just don't, they're, they have a, la a fundamental lack of knowledge about some of these processes. And instead of asking their staffs about it and the people who work in city hall and have the answers, they have, they conjecture and speculate about really basic stuff like a consent agenda and what goes on a consent agenda. Or, you know, this $25,000 was on page 52 of a warrant, which is how we pay invoices. And they were accusing Commissioner Moran of burying it on page 52. 
Well, things are listed in alphabetical order. That's why it was on page 52. Like, so there's just like these total lapses in knowledge that are, they're creating, you know, these huge problems out of that are so easily explained. Um, it, it's frustrating to watch. Yeah, but it's, uh, on a couple of occasions, um, said he was going to form like a, almost a January sixth style yeah. to, to, to 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 provide transparency on on what is you know what happened to lead up to this you know this twenty five thousand uh, dollars bill that the city is a hundred thousand dollar settlement but the city's on the yeah. hook for twenty five thousand dollars of it which you know to me it's I just, I, how's he going to make it, uh, you know, an unbiased when, when the city attorney is, you know, we don't really have a city attorney. Uh, I mean, we have Tony Izzo now. I guess he's official the city attorney, right? Yeah, but how about nobody gives a shit? We want bike lanes. Listen to what the people want. They don't want, they don't give it. No one wants a big investigation. Yeah. Robin and Dalton it, as a Saratogian doesn't need to be the judge and jury. I don't need any more explanation. Yeah. 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 And, I just and, want it done. Yeah. And Ron Kim was saying, and the people of Saratoga Springs, like you said, well, the, it's like Ron has a habit of not letting things go. Now, yeah. there are some things that need to be addressed with this issue, the consent uh, uh, agenda and so forth. Agree what it is going forward, what it will be, what the procedure will be. Um, when a commissioner- That's already established. Settlements, I, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dan. The, oh, yeah, the consent agenda and the requirements to put something on the consent agenda are already set in stone and have been forever. So I don't and know they why they need to reiterate so that to each it. other and agree that they understand it and move yeah. forward. The 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 yeah. the issue the other issue with um uh, uh uh Commissioner Moran being involved in the settlement the way he was and the, were the email sent and so forth. I'm tired of it. I'm not saying there might not be a real issue there, but move forward. Like you said, we need bike lanes, we need sidewalks, we need to make sure kids don't get killed. And the fact that they don't realize that really bothers me. Well, I, th I think that some of them realize it. I wish that Mayor Kim realized it. To me, he is responsible for creating, self-creating all these problems since he's been in office that have nothing to do with the needs of the city and the residents of the city. And to me, like you run for the city council seat because you want to solve problems and make people's quality of life better here. That's it. The, uh, a, a side issue there, I see an apparent alignment between Commissioner Montanino and the mayor, almost like he sometimes yeah. almost parrots the mayor, not so outwardly, but it seems that they're connected. And um, you know, I, I'd like to see some more independence out of Commissioner Montanino. But but beyond that, I'd like to see some more cohesiveness between all five. And and the three that aren't involved need to gang up on those two and say enough. And uh, so far, they haven't done that. Uh, Commissioner Sanvi being out of the country, that you know, doesn't help. So maybe this will be just in September. But they, they need to resolve this. This is a, to the whole city council. I see you got to resolve this whole issue and stop it and make sure um, uh, Ron and, and Bill Moran stop it. I, 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 they share some of the blame. What percentage? Yeah, you know, probably more for Ron. King, I just, but they share some blame. In. I, I cannot imagine disrespecting a fellow city council member by calling them a liar. Uh, you know. Like the, just the accusations that were being hurled were so nasty and unprofessional. I mean, it's like it was like appalling to me. Um, and yes, yeah, so yeah, I do. I agree. They have to work it out. It's not a good look for anybody. But it's also just a colossal freaking waste of time. Colossal right. freaking waste of time. Yeah. I, like we've got we got shit that needs to get done, and it's not this. Well, we'll we'll wait we'll wait for that report to come out. Like a. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Adam, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, Robin, you may have forgotten at the very beginning of their term back in January, February, where they were singing Kumbaya and getting along great. You said, I don't like this lack of of, of animosity, or uh, you didn't use the word animosity, but this, this, you know, everyone's getting along too much. Well, yeah. you have terrible jazz for you, just might be. I <laughs> yeah, know. But, but one, thing I, one thing, too, I just, you know, for, for to, to give our viewers some, some background, another thing D Dylan said, and to give us a, a you know, our, our podcast, a little shout out. We talked about when Ron fired the city attorneys and wanted mm -hmm. to act as a city attorney. We said, this is, this is ludicrous. You can't off every commissioner needs unbiased legal advice. And, and, and I, Dylan referenced that last night and he said, yeah. you know, the accounts department is going to need to hire. And I don't, I don't know if he was talking about, you know, hiring an outside firm or creating a new job for, for unbiased, you know, because he needs, and I agree with him, he needs representation too. And he needs legal advice that's unbiased. And, 
And you know, Tony Izzo is a great guy, but he's he's caught in the. It's 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 just a. I think it, if we had an attorney, an assistant city attorney, there'd be more stability. And, and, and this could be, you know, these the, the laws, I think, are pretty clear in, the, in these instances. And, and 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 they could be getting this this unbiased dealing with this unbiased advice or or or, you know, some, so, or, or just somebody shedding some yeah. light on what's going on and why this is either OK or not OK with Dylan. Did. I, I think you just hit at the core of the issue because we have so many attorneys on the city council. We have uh, Ron Kim, who's a bankruptcy attorney. We have Jim Montanino, who um, arbitrated like divorce settlements. Uh, we have Angela Rella, the deputy mayor, who's also an attorney. But none of those specialties necessarily translate into understanding municipalities and how you know mm -hmm. the legal issues surrounding municipalities work. And, and Jason Golub, don't forget. Is an and, and of course, that's right. Yeah. And Jason Golub is also an attorney. However, he has not actually had to draw on that <laughs> as a. Right. Uh, as a talking point, which has been very refreshing because everyone else seems to be reminding us that they're attorneys over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, but but when yeah. I was on that council, almost every single day, I would be running something by Vince Still an artist. Uh, he also had eyes on everything that was going on the agenda. And if there was some issue or there was something that was incorrect, it would be brought to our attention before a city council meeting. So these potential problems would be resolved before they even began um, because we yeah, have I, that I, access. I feel bad for Jason, or Commissioner Gola, because he's in the middle of a campaign, and you know the last thing you want in the middle of a campaign is is this these kind of fireworks going off, uh, you know, around you, and then and then you'll be put on the spot. But um, but it is it is something. I, I again, I guess we're gonna get to talk about this again because there's going to be this report. I don't know, the, you know, what form it's gonna take, but we'll, we'll keep this. We'll keep Saratoga posted on what this report says and what we think about it. Hey, you guys, speaking of Commissioner Golub, really quick, I just wanted to say, and I'll continue to say this when he comes up, I am actually helping work on his campaign. And I wanted to just like put that out there because I do have a bias when I'm talking about him um, because I would like to see him get elected in November and, and I am actively helping on his campaign. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there, um, just to kind of be on the up and up here, you know, while we're having these conversations. He, he He's a neighbor of mine and I can't help but like him. Um, but I'm not involved like you, but the Republicans here got to be drooling. Like, oh, this is, this is, look at this. Look at the Democrats are in charge and things are in total dysfunction. This next election, besides Jason's election coming up, it is a year is a year away, a little over a year away. They, if they got their act together, they, they will be seizing on this and the Democrats have a short time to put this stuff behind them. And they can. I just don't know if they have an in them to do it. The, 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 yeah. I, I highly doubt the Republicans will be able to get it together enough such that they could overcome the enrollment advantage in Saratoga Springs, which is so heavily Democratic at this point. Um, because for viewers who don't know, right now in 2022, getting the Democratic line almost just almost ensures your victory in, um, in, a, in a local election here, uh, because there are probably I think about 2,500 more registered Democrats than there are Republicans. Um, and so having that line is, is, is crucial. And the Republicans have had a series of very high profile defeats over the last uh, several years. And, and now there are no Republicans on the city council, not one. So I think there, uh, what, 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 there should be one, but yeah, the, well, you know, but, but, but the stuff you debate at the council is not partisan. Like yeah. why would, I don't even think it should matter, you know? Well, you know, that's what just to go back to the to the campaign too. Ron, I mean, I remember you know Ron was going to get the city carbon neutral by what twenty twenty five. That was yeah, and 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 or I don't know, I don't know what the year 20, was. But, it was like in ten years. Yeah, yeah, but, but it, it, it's it's there's you know these campaign promises. I just I, I wish the Saratoga voter. I mean, I think I think for the most part that these these small elections, these city council elections our voted party line. And I, and it just, it, it drives me a little yeah. crazy because, you know, these campaign promises, what they elected these Democrats to do, you, you know, I don't think they're doing it. I don't, I, I don't think they're, they're, they're creating a, a, you know, they're creating hostile work environments. They're, they're fighting over things that has nothing oh, yeah. to do with what they campaigned on and of, 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 you know, creating this, this, uh, uh, you know, example of, of Ron saying that the, it's going to the city of Saratoga is going to be carbon neutral. I, you know, six months or eight months into the, in, into his term, what, 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 what have we done to become carbon neutral? Besides and, and, argue over $25,000 deductible. And, you know, we are critical of the council, but I, 
I like to think that we are trying to hold people accountable who have been elected to public office. And because I think that's really important. And one of the things that this council said they would do, for example, was listening tours in every neighborhood. They were gonna have listening tours. They were gonna have an extra city council meeting every month for pu just public comments. Has any of that happened? No, yeah. literally none. And when you say things like we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2032 or whatever, do we even know how to quantify what our carbon emission is right now? <laughs> no, you know, I mean, so it's just like, I feel like making those kind of promises is really irresponsible and not something I would ever feel comfortable doing running for any office. Um, which is probably why I'm not a great politician because I, I, I like to promise things that are realistic and not fantasies. Um, but I, I get, I, maybe it's just a lack of local media because we do need to be holding our public officials accountable and it should be less about the party and, and way more about the person and their platform. I, it, um, I, I do think Robin, I, I disagree with you slightly on, I do think Saratogians will cross over for a moderate Republican um if if it's if it's a moderate republican and and there's some issues let's well, face it ron kim he's a side he's you know you either like ron kim or you don't if you're paying attention right and some of those that yeah. don't are dems and if you get a reasonable alternative in the republican party that person has a legitimate shot um um heidi like skip Sirocco. By that much at all skip Sirocco was a republican who yeah. was really you know he was all about um land preservation the green belt um issues that you would not traditionally associate with a republican and he was reelected again and again he was really the only person who was a republican who had you know 12 or 14 years of success being reelected um so mm -hmm. I, that's you know maybe an example of the type of person you're talking about dan um but i don't yeah. know if moderate republicans exist anymore do they exist yeah, they rhino. Just, they've gone elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, but Republicans hate rhinos, so. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's the problem. Like, I don't know. And I don't know that the city Republican committee is interested in moving more to the center um, and, you know, doing things like, um, you know, the, saying that Donald Trump fucking sucks and try to overturn the, our democracy. You know, they're not on board with that yet. And I think that is... Um, means they are not going to have any success um, in Saratoga until they learn how to get more into the middle. But I agree, this uh, right. this group is, is having a hard time. All right, should we go to mm. Cheers and Jeers? Yes, let's go to Cheers and Jeers. What do you guys have? Dan, lead us off. I, okay, great. Um, uh, some ho a horse racing cheer. And I, I'm going to add them on your Facebook page, on the What's Going On Saratoga Facebook page. I'm going to post this as soon as we're we get off, and I should have did it already. There was a race on Saturday at the track. Robbie Davis, who used to be a jockey, he's now a trainer. He only won once at Saratoga way back in 2013. So there, there, there was a race. His daughter, Jackie, who has never won at Saratoga, was on the horse. The horse was Ballet Nuha, I, 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 if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Well, don't you know, he tells her, don't go on. Ah, wins it. Uh -oh. It was bedlam in the winter circle. It was such wait, a wonderful. Wait, Dan, we lost you for a second. Oh, okay. So Just what I was saying. Daughter, what, she, she, she on, on one of his horses, she won a race in Saratoga? On Saturday, and it was such bedlam. And I'm going to post the videos, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and a video's worth a million. The, Adam, I'm going to post it on, on what's going on Saratoga Facebook page, and I'll post it again on Saratoga Report. You have, folks, give me five minutes after we sign off you have to see these videos they are so intoxicatingly fun whether you're a horse fan or not that's the key it's just it's just a human story a father who has not had much success at saratoga wins with his daughter on the horse she has not had much success at saratoga so i'm, I'm spoiling it for you but uh, a lot of you are horse racing fans and you know this story anyway and then they interviewed her the second video is an interview with jackie davis on her way back it is the most touching interview and I love that it can be five minutes. Check either Saratoga Report or what's going on Saratoga Facebook. Dan, page. Will you drop them in will you drop it in the comments too? Oh yes, yes, like I'll start point? there. I'll start there. Should have should have that great. immediately. Um uh, a jeer and you know, maybe well it's a jeer. Uh, um I was out to Buffalo recently where I'm from, had to see some family, and I um, of course had to make a stop at probably two stops at Wegmans. 
and I'm just, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a, I am a supermarket snob. Wegmans just <laughs> melts my heart. I love it. There's so much. The food is just beautiful, and it makes it's 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 like I was going to say the supermarkets are underwhelming, but they're beyond that. They depress me. The 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 fried I know. foods and for 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 the and go and everything like that. I hope this new place coming into the uh, Price Chopper downtown, where the old Price Chopper location uh, delivers on at least um, uh, uh, grab and go foods, take home you know prepared to or prepared to take home foods. Uh, there's a term for it I can't remember, but I I'm I'm really not happy with none none of the supermarkets around here. Whether you know even though Fresh Market and Healthy Living are a step up. Um, in four seasons, I got to give them a shout out because I do do like them. But I'm still, you know, until we have Wegmans, I will be dissatisfied. And Dan, when I moved up here from Manhattan, I assumed there would be Wegmans here because I went to Cornell and like lived at Wegmans and freaking loved that place. And when I got here and heard that the Golubs, who own Price Chopper, have this gentleman agreement with the Wegmans, who own Wegmans, and they agree to not expand into each other's territory. I practically packed up my stuff and left. I was like, are you kidding me? If I died. And then, you know, Price Shopper has expanded into Market 32. They've expanded their prepared foods, but it's all like junk. And, junk. and there's no junk. one place to get all your stuff. It's right. super frustrating. Right. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. God love Wegmans. They're yeah. the freaking best. Adam, have you ever been to a Wegmans? No, I was going to say. Oh, no. my God. Never, but now I, now you got to take a field trip. I'm going to take a field trip to Syracuse. place on earth. Yeah, oh, I live there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And some know okay. exactly what we're talking about, and, and and some for those of you that don't drive to Syracuse and go to a Wegman someday, if you're if you find yourself driving out west, it's 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 almost a must stop, and uh, puts puts price sharper to shame. They they do compete in Syracuse, uh, the Golub and and Wegmans, and and I've heard that story about the gentleman's agreement. I, yeah. I don't know if it's an urban myth or or what, but uh, I've heard it enough times and it seems logical. Then we see uh, Wegmans trucks coming through the capital region on their way to Massachusetts, which is galling. It's like, you couldn't put a store here? Who knows Danny Wegman? We got to give him a call and tell him to come on down to Saratoga Springs. Screw the gentleman's agreement. Come on down. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Adam, you got me. Oh, my cheers and cheers. Okay, my dear, real quick. Station three groundbreaking yesterday. There was a little bit of drama because the city council and Mayor Kim did not invite essentially anyone to the groundbreaking, except for I got an invitation at 6 p.m. the night before. I believe Mayor Kelly got an invitation the night before, but um, invitations were not extended to the previous fire chiefs, previous commissioners, so many people who had a huge hand in making this happen. And that was just a bummer because everyone should have been included and it should have been a big group celebration. Everyone who had a hand in making it happen should have been able to be there at the groundbreaking and and then celebrate together. And the fact that that didn't happen because they weren't able to figure out how to invite people, it's just sucky. So that is my cheer. Um, my cheer is actually a little throwback cheer, which is for Adam Israel, because we were going to do this on one of our podcasts, but we didn't, I don't know, you must have been traveling. It was in our little July break. Adam was honored by the Yankees for the work he's doing in Ukraine and with Letters of Hope Ukraine. And they brought him down to Yankee Stadium and literally he threw out the first freaking pitch at Yankee Stadium and was honored for all of his work. And it, it was so freaking incredible to see and watch and so deserved. And I just, it was so awesome. And so I might have one of the videos, but I just wanted to do that as my cheer because it's really, really deserved. Well, thank you, Robin. And I'm just, I'm just glad I can keep Ukraine in the, in the headlines. Uh, you know, being over here and meeting the people I'm meeting and seeing what's happening and hear the stories I hear. It's, 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 it's just, it's good versus evil right now. It's, it's the front line of democracy, and 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 Ukrainians are spilling their blood for not just, uh, not just Europe, but for, for again all of democracy. And I'm, I'm glad I could keep the spotlights in, uh, on them, and, and that that the Yankees helped me do that. Uh, while you look for the video, Robin, or, or yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do my I'll do my cheers and jeers. Um, awesome. My my cheer goes to Liz Cheney. Uh, Liz Cheney it, it lost her 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 primary in, in Wyoming by a by a, a large a large number two to three. You know, I think they think that her opponent got two thirds of the votes. Uh, the opponent was an election denier. Um, Liz Cheney in, in her her concession speech talked about how 
she could have gone up there and, and toted the party line, continued with her political career, um, but that's not who she was. Uh, she said she's a conservative Republican. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about of, of can, you know, can the Republicans come back to the middle? It's this internal fight going on in the party, I think. Um, and and for her to, to sacrifice, and, and the, the, the flip side is, I hope this is not her sacrificing her political career. I hope this- She's her, not. People like Adam Kinzinger, I hope this this leads to bigger and, and, and better things for them because I think it takes a lot of courage. You, you know, it takes a lot of courage to go against your own uh, and to go against your own people and to stand up for what you think is right. And, and, and you, you know, I think about, Robin, what you and I did. You know, I, I, when, 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 when you ran, when I ran as an independent, I, I, I knew there was a much better chance of winning if I, if I saw a party line. But I just it, it was I'd rather lose than, than, than win, win. I'd rather lose right than win wrong. And, and, and I just commend Liz Cheney for that. My cheers. My Adam, cheers. I got to tell you, it practically made me cry watching Liz Cheney because I left the Republican Party for the same reasons, knowing it would screw my chances of being reelected. And so just to see her say that, and, and I don't know, it, it was, we, it was we need, incredibly. We need, more, we need more people like her. My, we do. My jeer goes to Commissioner Shang, Sangvi, Commissioner Sangvi. Uh, I like her a lot. I have a respect for her. Obviously, our politics don't agree. She beat me in the election. Um, but, you know, she got elected. You're supposed to be here during, especially now during budget season, not often globetrotting around India. Uh, I get, to, I lost. That's the perk of losing. I can, you know, I don't have to be anywhere. But, but um, <laughs> so, you know, Commissioner Sangvi, cheers to you for, you know, leaving a city council when, when, when there's, you know, right in the middle of, uh, the, or right in the, as budget season's ramping up. So. I agree. It's, it's it's a short term. It's a two year term. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of city council meetings, and I do think it's important to be there. Um, and it's too bad she can't like zoom in or something. You know. Um, but anyway, guys, this has been a great podcast. Lots of stuff to talk about. Sorry if I was a little scattered. I've got no childcare and four kids at home, and uh, it's been a little crazy this summer. Yeah. All right. Thank God All for right. my mother in law. <laughs> I'll, I'll be posting those videos, folks, that I talked about in five minutes. I'll start with this um, with on YouTube, right, Robin? In the in the comments, is that where I'm posting it, or on here? Uh, anywhere. F Facebook. Usually, Facebook. The Facebook pages get the most views. So maybe drop it in Facebook comments wherever you want. Okay. Great. Right. All right. I'll put it right. By the same Yankee toss. Yes. Yes, Thanks I will do that too. Stay safe, Adam. Thanks, guys. Bye. Glad we got together. <laughs>